very lucky today to have Ravina Claxton. She is an SBDC consultant. SBDC, we have co offices and consultants in every part of the state. We're very fortunate for that. Andy Donahue, who's joining us, is our state director. We're grateful for his leadership. And like various uh, SBDC consultants, everyone has various subject matter expertise and knowledge. And Ravina is here to help us um, understand better the Earned and Sick Safe Time, the ESST program that is actually run out of the Department of Labor and Industry, not DEED, but we know it is affecting small businesses and small businesses want to get some more answers. So we're going to pass this over to Ravina. Um, she usually, you know, this is a lot of information. She was kind enough today to try to narrow it down to our call uh, to about 15, 20 minutes of information. And then the rest of the time is for you to ask questions uh, to her and to others on the call. So with that, Ravina, thank you so much for joining us. And I will um, get your slides loaded up. All right. Um, actually, if you want to just allow me to share the screen. Perfect. Do that. That'd be perfect. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Hang on a minute. How about now? Here, there it is. All right, very good. So let's start from the beginning. And let me just add to the introductions. I have um, not only worked with the SBDC for the last four years, but spent a career in human resources, uh, leadership roles in the Twin Cities and St. Paul, Minneapolis and St. Paul, when they were implementing the 2017 Earned Sick and Safe Time Statute, as well as in Duluth when they implemented their uh, city statute or city ordinance for Earned Sick and Safe. You also might uh, be interested in the fact that I, my husband and I own our own small business outside of the Twin Cities in Brooklyn Park. We are not currently covered by Earned Sick and Safe Time, but we will be. Uh, coming in January of next year. So we have a keen interest in uh, doing this properly as well. So as um, was indicated already, I have a lot of information to go over and very limited time. I've seen the questions that have been submitted for the call. Some of them will definitely be answered in the presentation. There are others that quite frankly are very um, deep dive sorts of questions and not I'm not able to answer those in this context. So I am hopeful that you will reach out for additional support either to your um, counsel, your employment attorney, or to a regional small business development center uh, where you can register for services. I am able to, to handle the deep dive questions and the particular um, situations that, you know, based on your business, the type of business you're in, the number of employees, um, I'm able to handle those questions um, much better in that kind of setting. So let's just go over the basics. The Earn Sick and Save Time statute was passed in the state in order to provide a safety net. Um, in order to the, the state legislatures, I've talked to several senators, were attempting to provide a tool that would attract and retain employees and provide for healthier workplaces. Now, the other thing you should note is that this is by no means unusual across the country. There are a number of paid sick leaves all across the country. Um, you can see some of the states that have some form of paid sick leave that are colored on the map there. This is Patriot Software. They are a payroll provider. Um, obviously, we will be coloring in the Minneapolis or the Minnesota and Illinois state um, states because those statutes are coming in 2024. So I'll cover the basics, how much time you need to provide for what uses, 
And because I work with so many small business owners, I have a pretty good feel for what some of the watch outs are with existing policies you may have that may need to be modified based on the particulars of the state statute. There are some considerations for how you choose to provide the time, whether you choose the accrual method or front loading, go through some of those considerations. There are required notices. There are some notices that you may or may not have been doing that uh, I know a lot of small businesses that I work with weren't aware of the notices that were put in place some time ago prior to even ESST required notices an employer has to give new employees. So we'll go through how to make that easy with and catch up on those with the new ESST statute. We'll have probably limited time for questions, but again, I think that I can answer many of those that have been submitted in the next 10 minutes. 15 minutes. All right, so the most important thing about this statute from my perspective is to keep it really simple. If you are already providing PTO or paid sick leave, you're not required to provide additional time, but you must meet the minimum requirements that have been set forth in the statute. One attorney described it to me as there are two sets of two buckets of requirements, one are substantive, meaning that you have to require you have to provide the amount of time that is required, paid time, but then there are the procedural. So how it is used and administered is also got to be covered in your practices and policies. It's important not to confuse earned sick and safe time with the state administered paid family medical leave. That is coming in January of 26. This statute, Earn Sick and Save Time, comes out of your pocketbook, okay? You have to pay this time based on the requirements that I'll go over. But the paid family medical leave, which is designed for longer absences, um, critical illness, the illness of a family member, that statute is for what we know about it now, effective January 1 of 26, you'll be able to share the cost through payroll deductions of that benefit with your employee. But you're gonna to wanna to watch carefully for further information about how you set up those accounts. I'm imagining that it will be something as we know it today and have been provided some information, it will be an account like a um, an unemployment account so you will want to watch for more information and that is where you can assess some level of charge through payroll deduction for that now here's the basics of earn sick and save time this statute applies to all employers that have one or more employees it's a little different than the city ordinances in the twin cities which have a, a higher threshold it does not include federal, so virtually every small business owner is going to be covered by this. It doesn't include federal government employees and staffing agencies. If you employ temps, they are considered to be the employee of the agency, provided that the contract doesn't say anything different and that they are truly an agency temp. You haven't hired them yourself. All right. Employee, and this was some questions that were um, submitted. Employee what, means what? employee means anyone, temporary, seasonal, part-time employees, paid interns, whether they're paid hourly or salary, who perform work for your business for 80, 80 hours or more in a year. It does not include independent contractors. Those would be 1099 workers. There were some questions about that. It includes anybody that you consider to be an employee, regardless of their age. If they are under 18 and you employ them as a worker in your business, they are covered. Now, if they're seasonal, and certainly many businesses employ seasonal workers, 
and they they do not qualify for ESST until they've worked 80 hours. However, if they leave you, they qualify, they leave you, they have some balance accrued, and you rehire them next year, let's say next summer, you hire them to come back in, then if you hire them within 180 days, you have to restate the, reinstate the balances. So that speaks to having good record keeping. Now, here are the options that you have for providing ESST. You can provide it as an accrual, which means that the employee would accrue one hour for every 30 hours that they work. The maximum that you are required to provide is 48 hours. You have to allow the employee to carry over anything unused, but it doesn't have to be paid out at termination. In the second year, you have to allow that it, the second year, assuming, for example, for example, it's a calendar year because that's when you're required to start this benefit, assuming January 1, that of 2025, they start accruing more because they're starting to accrue once again 48 hours. That accrual stops at 80 hours. You are never required to have more than 80 hours in that bucket available for use. You also have the ability to front load, and there are some considerations you might consider using a front load method. In that method, there are two options. You can provide it 48 hours um, for the year as a front load immediately available January 1. Um, and if you use that method, you do have to pay out anything unused at the end of the accrual year. You also have the option to front load 80 hours. That front load is um, meets your obligation, you do not have to pay it out, anything unused at the end of the accrual year, but you have to make it immediately available. If you are considering using the front loading method, I would highly recommend you study the information on the Department of Labor website. I will say this, they are adding more FAQs all the time. I went in there and looked yesterday, they have um, added a number of new FAQs on the Department of Labor, Minnesota Department of Labor site, um, effective last week. Um, so it is becoming a better and better source of information. Now, I'm not going to go through all these um, uses because it's a long laundry list. But bear in mind, it is for sick and safe. So it's for the employee's own illness, family member, broadly defined domestic violence issues, closure of the business due to a public emergency, uh, weather, inability to work because of that, or the health authorities have um, determined that there's a communicable disease at, at play here and the business or the employee or the family member cannot be at work. Here's the definition of family member under ESST. I will point out to you that it is very broadly defined. And the last two points, any individual related by blood, close association, equivalent of family member. It also provides in statute language up to one individual annually designated by the employee. That might be my illustration is I have a neighbor, an elderly neighbor that needs to go to the doctor once a month. She's not related to me, but I would like to use my ESST time that I have accrued or is available to me as a front load to um, be paid for that time that I use to um, help her. This is a common question. I received some of those uh, questions like this um, relative to this call. I provide paid leave that exceeds the minimum time. I don't need to do anything else, right? Not exactly. If you remember that there are procedural, or there are statutory, or I'm sorry, sub substantive. So that's the amount of time, which you've already said you, it's equivalent or better, but there's also the procedural. So you probably still have some work to do. If you offer PTO, 
PTO is generally broadly defined by the employer to cover any absence. You're going to want to make sure that you say, and this is directly from attorneys that I have worked with on this, either you know, add additional, you can add a sick and safe benefit if you like, but explain in writing that the first 48 hours of that PTO that is provided are considered to have met your obligation under earned sick and safe time. Do you currently offer sick leave? You've got to make sure is available for all the uses that are afforded by law. And so the first thing to do is start with a side by side with the statute requirements and um, your policies. So you might need policy language. The statute does say if you have a handbook, you have to put the policy language in your handbook. They also give you notices if you don't have a handbook and you should give those notices out anyway. I'll cover those in a minute, but this is an example of a statement in a handbook. The first 48 hours of PTO used each year counts as earned sick and safe time in compliance with Minnesota statute, blah, blah, blah. So that would be um, an example of procedural information that you need to add to your practices. Now, here's a couple of really important caveats for ESST. Unlike other ordinances in other cities and maybe your paid time off policy, there's no 90 day waiting period for use. For example, I had one question that came in something about a probationary period. Um, and because sometimes PTO can't be used until you've passed your probation. That's very common practice. Not so with ESST. Once it is either front loaded or accrued, it has to be immediately available for use. So you're going to want to watch language like that in your policies. It must begin to accrue at the commencement of employment and it may be used as it is accrued. That first payroll, I've got one hour of uh, ESST that's been accrued and available to me. I can use that. And it has to be used and it has to you have to make it available for use in the smallest amount of time that is tracked by your employer's payroll system. Uh, provided that it's not more than four hours. So it might be, you know, 15 minutes if you use that that kind of um, time clock version of how you track time. Um, some employers are going to be tracking it by the minute or you could say the smallest amount of time I track is hourly so you can use it hourly. But you've got to decide what that is. How is a year defined? The law gives you the ability to define what the year is. It means a regular and consecutive 12 month period. Now there there is a little bit of a you know a, a, a rub with this because you have to make this you have to comply January 1st. And so I believe that most employers will probably make it a calendar year that is used for accrual or front loading purposes, but it is OK if you use anniversary or fiscal year also permitted. You have to communicate that. What's better, the front loading method or the accrual method? I can't answer that for your business. You have to consider a few things. How you currently provide any paid time off for employers that are already doing an accrual method of some sort and providing it every payroll. It, it, it might make perfect sense just to do this providing of earned sick and safe time or saying that your PTO meets the, the, the minimum requirements by the pay period. You have to consider your turnover rate. If you have a high turnover rate, I would be very thoughtful before um, adding a front load, before using a front loading method, because again, either 48 or 80, depending on how you do it, is available for immediate use. And but of course, you've got to have um, the ability to track it in your payroll system. One of the first calls you want to make is if you use an external provider, um, is to your payroll company to find out the national companies like the Patriot, like so many of them that are out there, are very familiar with setting these up. We just had a conversation with our payroll provider the other day about how this is going to be done. They're very familiar with it. If you use QuickBooks, the SBDC has 
QuickBooks experts that can help you with that if you're doing your own payroll. And of course, if you front load 48 hours, you have to pay anything unused out at the end of the year. So you got to be able to afford that at the end of the year. Here are some more procedural and record keeping um, uh, aspects to it. You can require seven days notice if it's foreseeable leave. I have a doctor's appointment for my kid. I have a sick kid today, I can't come to work. That's um, as soon as practicable, obviously. Um, that's a, a, an appropriate use of any available ESST time, any available ESST time. And as soon as practical is however you manage your call-ins. To require a notice, you must have a written policy. Now the notice the state gives you to use does contain that. You are, an, the employee is always entitled to, you, you cannot terminate their employment for using ESST. You can't terminate their health insurance for using it. So those are a couple of, of the finer points. But these are important because I, the last two in red, because I run into these all the time with handbooks. You can't require an employee. They call in, you know, or you have a PTO scheduling model that they have to give you, you know, two weeks notice for your PTO. But they call in and have an ESST reason. It's, you know, three days out or something of that nature. You can't ever require them for any ESST usage to find a replacement worker. And sometimes I see that language in handbooks. Nor can you punish them on your attendance policy side. Take any kind of punitive action, whether it's points or whether it's corrective action for using ESST as long as it's available. It is protected time. OK. When they use sick and safe time for more than three days, that would be four days on an employer may require reasonable documentation that is covered by the statute. Now the state has gone on in some of the technical papers to describe the fact that they don't want to require employees to have to go pay for a doctor's appointment, go running to the doctor all the time and get a doctor's note. Um, so you may be, depending on the circumstances, you may be for, you may have to use an assigned attestation, but I would use that. I have written these forms. It just basically says I, John Smith, um, used, uh, was absent from X date to Y date, four days or more, and this was for a use that was protected by Minnesota statute 187, the rest of the statute, and have them sign it, put it in their file. That's a signed attestation. Now, here's the other part of the procedural part that is really important. The total number of ESST hours accrued and available for use has got to be shown on the pay stub. The total number of hours that were used have got to be shown on the pay stub. I early on call the department or email the Department of Labor and ask, if it says PTO on my pay stub, does it have to say ESST now? And I was told, yes, in fact, it does. So when we met with our payroll provider, that little space says PTO, it now says PTO slash ESST. So again, these are things that you need to talk to your payroll provider about or reach out to SBDC for some QuickBooks support. Here are some other just finer points. You can't threaten the employee. You, you don't have to, the employee doesn't have to explicitly refer to ESST to be protected from retaliation. There is a $10,000 fine for violations of this act. And there's some other things that I won't, uh, I've already talked about discipline. Now, I mentioned early on, how am I doing on time? <laughs> am I okay on time, folks? Um. A couple Just more minutes to okay. wrap it up. I, OK, a few more. There's some other questions. OK, thank you. So so here is the notice. All right. It is available out there on the Department of Labor website. And 
you will notice that it covers the things I just talked about, including notifying the employer and how you do that. You call in to your supervisor um, and that's on that left hand down at the bottom of the page. You probably can't read it, but you can see on the screen that there is some that's read, um, some text that's read. That's where you put your particular policy in. Fill that out. If you have a handbook, you're also going to have to add the language there. Here are two other notices that are at play, and I frankly would do all three notices on January 1 or thereabouts. The notice on the left is what's called the Minnesota um, Employee Notice, but it's in keeping with a law that was passed 7-1, July 1st of 2019, called Minnesota Wage Theft Law. It basically says every employee that goes to work for your business needs to get this notice. So this should be given out when you hire an employee. The important information is things like, you know, when am I going to get my first check? How often am I going to get paid? How am I going to be paid? Exempt, non-exempt, in other words, overtime eligible or, or not? Um, here are the deductions that are going to come out. And the arrow shows that the leave benefits need to be added there. ESST, you need to add that there. Or however you are, you know, denoting that PTO slash ESST, um, whatever you have, the decision that you have made for your business. That needs to be signed by the employee. You need to give a copy to the employee of their signed document. Retain one for your records. And the law says that any time anything changes, that's why it needs to be reissued on January 1st. Anytime anything changes, like you give your employee a wage increase, you need to reissue it. So make it a template, make it easy, um, and you know put it as part of your hiring process along with your I-9 and the other things you have to do. There is one additional notice it is called the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act notice. It was an extension of a law passed some time ago in the state, maybe 2018, somewhere around in there, called the Women's Economic Security Act, which attempted to level the playing field for women in the workplace. This is a pregnancy accommodation notice. You are required to give this out to all new employees effective July 1st of this year. I would print that and go ahead and give it out when you're giving these other notices out. So where to from here? I again recommend that you start with a side-by-side -side, um, uh, comparison. In these specific employee questions, questions that my business I do X, Y, and Z, I, I don't want, you know, I want to give you a very fair response to that. I need to ask questions and understand the details. So I would encourage you again to reach out to your friends at the SBDC. And most importantly, sign up for the updates. They're at the bottom of this page out there on the Department of Labor website. Um, sign up to get their email updates and they are very good about sending you um, updates as they are available. So thank you. And I will turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you. That was a lot of information in a short time, and there are many questions for you, Ravina. <laughs> You've uh, sparked some uh, some questions here, and Maddie LeClaire um, is also helping go through the chat. Um, let's just start from the, the top, and then um, we'll, we'll work through it here. My understanding is that you don't have to pay out at the end of the year as long as you as long as you carry it over. Correct? You mentioned that earlier. Uh, yes, if you if you accrue, you do not have to pay it out. If you front load 48 hours and there is nothing and there is anything left, you do have to pay that out. If you front load 80, you don't have to pay it out. So there's three methods. The payout works differently. It's only if you front load 48, make it immediately available and there's anything left at the end of the year. That's the only time you have to pay it out. Unless you have a PTO policy that you that covers all of this time, 
and you pay out PTO. I mean, you obviously have to look at your own policies, but that's what the ESST statute says. Okay, and I just encourage people to use the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you here to get your questions answered. Uh, another one from Deborah. It sounds as though staying home with a sick child who is sick is covered the same as, as the employee. Is a sick care sick child care provider also covered? That is, if the child's care provider is sick, does ESST cover this absence? Yes, that would be also covered. Because from, apparently they have, you know, they have to care the daycare is closed. It's not available because the provider is sick. So that would also be covered because the employee ha can't come to work for that reason. Thank you. A, a question from Maria. Are employers required to pay out the, out the balance of any unused ESST when employment is terminated? Uh, the employer terminates. Um, that is a question I, so they have something available. It would only be if the front loaded method was used. Okay, again, that's the only time payout is required. If the front loaded, say the employee and the employer front loaded 48 hours, there was time left during that year and the employee was terminated. The question becomes, do I have to pay it out because I use the front loading method, which says I have to pay out anything that is left? I would say no, because they haven't fulfilled the entire year. However, I would want that question specifically checked with the Department of Labor just to make sure. Thank you for that. Another question from Antonio. Will this apply to construction companies and subcontractors as well? There is a caveat about construction um, on the uh, Minnesota Department of Labor website. That is probably something worth checking on. Um, but if they are an employee of yours and you run a construction company, clearly they are covered. Okay. And Ravina, we've lost your video, it looks like, um, but maybe that's that's on me. Um, and then David had a question. If I'm an S Corp and I'm my only employee, how much will I have to pay the state to participate in this program? How does this program benefit me? Well, it sounds as though your question is more pertaining to um, the paid leave that is state run in 26. There were some other questions that pertain to business owners, um, and those I think are best represented with an employment attorney because there are a wide variety of business structures. Um, I would say that, you know, if you are a business owner, you may or may not want to provide this benefit to yourself. Some owners take a draw. It's coming from their finances. And actually, you know, an owner can kind of take time when they need it anyway. So there isn't any statutory requirement that necessarily covers an owner of a business outright. Okay, so here's a, another question just to con confirm what you just said. So if we don't front load hours and an employee is terminated or chooses to leave, um, do we still need to pay out accrued time? That's the same question I asked, okay. Okay. answered earlier. Yeah, it was front loaded. They, they were just confirming that, I, I think. Yeah, just, I, okay. I, I would say not, but I would not want to be quoted on that particular piece because I have not seen that specifically. That is a good question, and I have not been asked that before, nor have I seen it on the FAQs. Um, there are some extended conversations about front loading and payout on legal websites of lawyers in the state. Um, but I'm not sure that the state has even answered that one, but it's a, it's a good question to submit to them. 
Okay, Maddie, how are we doing with questions in the chat here? Have I missed any? Uh, we have, uh, yeah, they've been accumulating at the bottom. Thanks, so thanks for uh, sending those in, everyone. Um, there's one from Krista. What about industries that are required to pay prevailing wages for multiple crafts? How is the pay determined? I'm not sure I, I understand that question. Um, there is a um, clarification on the Department of Labor website about different rates of pay. And that applies in multiple different kinds of situations um, that I run into with small businesses. Um, you know, I'm going to work over in this department, it pays higher. So whatever they clarify that on the Department of Labor website, they say whatever you were scheduled when you have a need to use the ESST time has to be paid at that time at that rate. OK, so that would be the answer to that question. I saw one come up about elected officials and they specifically have a um, FAQ on there. Um, I have some municipal city clients. They have a specific um, uh, FAQ out on the website that says city officials, elected officials are not covered. Okay, thank you. Uh, this should be a, a quick one, but just a basic. Who uh, came up with these guidelines? How did they originate? They were originated at the state legislature. I can't answer that question. Got it. Um, and let's see, uh, can this be paid out without taking time off? Here, here, here's the deal on those kinds of questions, and they're good ones. But here's the deal on those kind of questions. You can always exceed the minimum requirements. You just got to make sure that you communicate that. So if you want to pay it out, sure, pay it out. Um, it's not required in the state that you pay out PTO, for example, from when an employee terminates. However, you have to, the, the, the the practice you want to make sure you're using is that you establish what your rules are and tell your employees so that you do not face any sort of discrimination complaints. So again, you can exceed the requirements and if you want to pay it out, you certainly can pay it out, but you will want to inform your employees of that. Thank you. A uh, question from Lori. Um, if an employer currently offers 90 hours of PTO annually to be used however an employee wishes, and an employee chooses to use 80 hours for a vacation, is the employer obligated to offer additional time if a medical reason arises later in the year and they want additional paid time under ESST? That's a really specific question that I would want to look at the policies about use before answering. Um, you know, again, if you are con using your PTO time that you are providing, you know, 90, 90, would you say 90 hours? Yes. Obviously exceeds the minimum requirement of 48 hours. So, you know, you can't. That's why you want to use a statement like we considered the first 48 hours of PTO used, if you've got a PTO policy, to meet our obligation under ESST. For that reason, you know, that example, even though I can't really thoroughly answer the question without looking at your handbook, your policies, how you practice and work, you would want to have that statement in there because if they use it for vacation, they have exhausted your obligation because you've said, it's all one bucket, and I consider the first 48 hours used as my obligation under ESST. So you've checked off that box um, because you've said that, and you've communicated that that's the rules, which I am employing because I offer something that's in excess of what's required. So these are really good questions. Hopefully you're getting answers to some of them, not all, but. Yeah, doing else? my best to uh, doing my best to cover as many of these questions as possible. Sure. Um, 
if if our staff is paid commission, how do we decide what to pay? Does that affect uh, it at all? That's a really good question, and I've gotten various mm -hmm. forms of that. The state doesn't answer that question specifically, but says you need to have a reasonable method for translating um, commissions into an hourly rate of pay. They um, say something to the effect of, and I'll you know kind of describe it as best I can um, in the FAQs. They say something to the effect of establish something reasonable. Maybe it's the last few paychecks, how much commission was paid, translate that into an hourly rate and accrue um, accordingly. Now, I have one uh, business owner that I worked with recently that's in a, a spa type, uh, you know, personal services uh, business and pays commission, but schedules appointments by the hour. So the schedule fills up by the hour with appointments even though they're not paid by the hour, they're paid by a commission that rep that has a correlation to an hour of service. So that one is a matter of bringing two different accounting, you know, methods. They're somehow or another using Square or whatever to to calculate the services rendered and then the time on the schedule. So you got to bring those two together and come up with how you're going to translate a commission into an accrual rate. And this employee, this employer was trying to decide if it's better for me to front load or to accrue. But if they were to accrue, you would want to have some sort of method to marry those two up. Okay, thank you. Um, if an employee uses up all ESST and is requesting additional time over 48 hours, uh, can employers have more strict policies than ESST in place? For example, could an employer create a rule that after 48 hours of ESST are used, employees are required to provide documentation for any unplanned absence that lasts longer than one day? Yes, you could. As long as you don't touch that 48 hours, that is protected time. Um, part time salary employee rec recommendation on how to set up ESST. Well, uh, you said part time salaried. Correct. Yeah, that's a question from Dan. If you'd like to clarify, Dan. So this is somebody that is paid for a certain number of hours that are deemed by the employer to call, be called uh, part-time. And they're paid a regular salary. Um, and of course they never exceed 40 hours or they might be overtime eligible depending on the type of job, correct? Am I hearing that question properly? Because if I am, you know, it, what you do is you accrue PTO based on hours worked. So if they're paid a salary, you know, a full time, and the, the, the FAQs address this, a full time employee is assumed to be 40 hours if they're an exempt. Okay, they, they get a salary, they meet a certain compensation level, they're covered by the federal wage and hour exemptions. So an exempt professional employee is assumed to work 40 hours for the purposes of accruing PTO. If there's something less and they're a salaried employee, they're not getting paid by the hour, but they're getting a paid, paid a salary for a certain number of hours that are on average worked, then you would accrue based on what those hours are. Okay. Got it. Uh, David or Dan did clarify the employees working about 20 hours a month and they uh, are working when they want, so they choose their own schedule. Um, and then they are they all if they're this is where we get into the detail of the question. Are they clocking the hours or they work about 20? You always pay them if you're always consistently paying them for 20, then that's what you would accrue ESST on. But if it's some variation of that, then I would have to understand what the variation is. It's, is it clocked hours or what is it? Okay. 
Now we do have, uh, there is, uh, as Ravina mentioned, um, quite a few different, this is a separate program from the FMLA, um, but I can see how some people may be confused about where the crossover is. So uh, David wants to know um, uh, about more, the, I mean, perhaps the difference here, the paid family time off that was passed to start uh, in 2025. Um, no, I read. No, no. 26? 26. 26. 26. 26. <laughs> 26. Okay. Yeah. Don't make it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read I have to pay the state for this program, even though I'm my own boss, my own only employee in an S Corp. Is this true? Will I have to pay the state money for this program? If so, how much and why? How does this benefit me? Oh, those are some very specific questions. We do not know the answer to those answers are not available. Now, I will say this. If you're a sole proprietor, you know, you may have a S Corp, you may have some other business designation, but if you're the sole person, you don't you don't have one or more employees. You are the employee. So, you know, that to me would be the difference of whether or not I'm a participant in paid family medical leave. But my understanding of what's going to happen with paid family medical leave is as they are sending up these accounts, they're going to be in touch with employers. They're going to be making available information about how to set up the accounts. And, you know, there's going to be much more detail. And so, you know, certainly my hope would be that you are able to answer whether that's a benefit or not, or whether you even have to participate. I don't know the answer to that. We just simply don't know enough information. Now, what characterizes this program differently is that it is like federal family medical leave. Federal family medical leave says that you have protection for your job up to 12 weeks to care for, you know, either pregnancy or a serious illness of you or a family member. That was enacted in, in the 90s for employers of 50 or more, okay? Or fi I think it says 50 or more FTEs. I have a few seasonal bu businesses that, you know, over so many weeks of the year that we just go ahead and do it because, you know, they vary right around the 30 to 60 um, uh, number of employees. But in any event, so the law has been around a long time, but it's not paid. It just protects your job and your benefits for 12 weeks. So this, this program for 2026 is designed to be the paid version of that, where you will pay in for the state to run it. And you can also pass, I believe I've read 50% of the cost, but you will wanna confirm that because not locked down in stone, but all you know, uh, indications now are that you can pass the portion of the cost of the program onto your employees through their payroll. So let's say you pass on, you can, the charge is 0.0725 for every hour. I don't know, it's something like that. You can pass 50% of that on via payroll deduction that allows you to help you pay that for that into the state, just like unemployment. It, it from what I read is just like employ, unemployment accounts. Now I will say this, the state of Massachusetts has had this program paid family medical leave for those extended absences, not sick and safe causes, which are very sporadic here and there, you know, sick day here, sick day there, kids sick day there. Um, the, the extended leave benefit the state of Massachusetts has had for a number of years, and I worked with a client last year in the state of Massachusetts. They have a state run program. Here's how it works. Employee goes out for surgery. They, you give them the paperwork. They file it with the state. The state decides whether or not they qualify for the benefit. They usually use, in this case in Massachusetts, they use some sort of insurance provider that's providing that assessment, just like if you had a disability plan, okay? They get back to you, they say, John Smith is approved from X date to Y date um, for this benefit, and then they are paying the benefits. 
you can um, there was something in there that you could allow them to use their PTO to give them more of a full check because like unemployment, it's not going to be a full replacement. I would very seriously doubt that it's going to be any kind of full replacement of weekly wages. Um, it's going to be some percentage of that. So, I mean, that's in concept how I understand that the program will work, but many more details to come. All right, thank you, Rabina. And of course, everybody wants to know when are those details coming? Um, do we have any update on that? Or is there a, a site that we recommend people, um, you know, refer to as these details are determined and released? Yes, um, Maddie, I put in, in the, the chat more information on paid family leave on our deed website and also the link to stay informed on upcoming um, updates internally. But once again, this is not launching until January of 26. So there's uh, it, it's still in the, the early stages of development. Uh, let's say I'm in year three of this ESST plan and my e, uh, EE has 80 hours of EST time and they they have carried over. If they go below 80, do I need to start accruing for them again at that time they go below 80? Yes, if they're a new accrual year. OK, got it. If it's a new accrual year, however you have defined that, they would start again and not and stop again at 80. Thank you. Um, let's see. OK, uh, any questions I missed in the chat, please uh, let me know or raise your hand. Um, oh, let's see. We got a new one from Christine. Uh, I read I read that I read there was some reporting that employers need to start doing in January 24 for the paid FML. Is this true? I don't know. I have also seen um, something similar to that, but there aren't any details provided on that at all. Um, so again, I think the best thing is to sign up for those updates and they will be made available. The details will be made available. It's two years out. Yes, legislation was just passed on the paid family leave. Um, and so now that was brought to our agency to try to implement. And that takes time to make sure that we implement it correctly. Sure. So um, there's a new leader that was hired um, and, and he is working um, at a quick pace to try to implement that and, and make sure that the voices of Minnesota are, are heard um, as that program is, is stood up. Very good. So thank you. Yes. There are many details still being uh, determined by this new office inside of DEED. So um, believe me, you will have all of the information by the time this is um, this goes into effect. Um, what audit procedures are in place to monitor ESST? I don't know. I have not seen anything on audit procedures. Um, if we pay in quarter hours, do we have to pay out in quarter hours? Yes. Again, the statute language I covered a little earlier was it has to be ESST pay has to be made available in the smallest increment of time that you track time. So the answer to that would be yes. Um, if an employer offers 40 hours sick time annually, is the employer obligated to increase to 48 hours ESST? Yes, because it would not meet the minimum statute requirement. Um, let's see. Uh, will there be grace provided to those employers that are showing uh, good faith in implementing this? I can't speak for the agency. I certainly, um, anytime you have a new statute, um, you know, I've had a similar question. You know, my payroll provider isn't ready yet. Um, can I just give them a sheet of paper that shows how much they've accrued until my payroll provider can put it on my pay stub? 
Well, I mean, I can't answer whether that's OK. It's certainly a good faith effort and you're working on it. I I, I don't give out grace, but it certainly seems like a very good effort um, to comply to me. Yep, Maddie, too, it looks like we have uh, Casey has a question. Yes, there I see that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Casey. Oops. Yes. Um, Will you please clarify again um, the question regarding the year three? So if at the end of the second year, the employee has 80 hours already, starting the third year, does the full 80 hours carry over? Yes. Or does it start at zero again? No, it carries over. Okay. Because you have to allow the carryover. So if in the scenario though, that wasn't the way the scenario was expressed the first time. Okay. Because, but you're always carrying over 80 and it never has to go above 80. So you're into the third accrual year, right? And so, but there's 80 hours there. So there's nothing more to accrue, even though you're in the third year. You know, when it drops down, the original question was it dropped down from 80. There was a usage. Well, you're in the third accrual year, so yeah, you replace that. Okay, all right, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, you bet. Uh, just to clarify, ESST 48 hours starts January 1st, 2024? Correct. Okay, got yes. it. All right, well, I believe we are almost at time, so uh, if anyone else has any other questions, they would like answered in the chat, uh, or if you would like to ask them yourself, go ahead and raise your hand. And I am also going to um, see if I can find an answer to the one question that was, if an employee has a balance the first year and is terminated, if that, and it was front loaded, it was front loaded. Does it have to be paid out? I'm going to see if I can find an answer to that. And I will get that to you um, at, at the office so that you can send that back out. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you. For, thank you for these questions. Uh, go ahead, Neil. I'll give it back to you. No, I just want to thank Ravina um, for your time and preparation for this call. Um, like I started off in the be beginning of the call, the Office of Small Business Innovation here at DEED is trying to bring information to small businesses so you're informed and can make the right decisions. If there are other topics that you want to have highlighted in the upcoming months, please put that in the chat. Uh, we are all working hard to serve our, our small businesses, our, our entrepreneurs, um, and so please let us know how we can provide even better service. Uh, we appreciate our partners on this call. Um, we appreciate all of you for attending and taking this time. Obviously, we're we're grateful for Ravina's uh, expertise and enlightening us on um, this new program through the Department of Labor and Inf Industry. Um, we hope to see you next month on the second Tuesday at two o'clock. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all.